So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for, thanks having, for us. having us. Absolutely. Can we start with who are you? I'm Ani Simon Kennedy. I'm uh, the writer and producer and director of the short history of the long road. Amazing. I'm Michael Salazar. I uh, worked on short history with Ani um, as her PA, then assistant directed on some of the pickups and reshoots when she came back to Albuquerque. Oh, wow. So you, you had to come, you were here and then gone and came back to film or? Yes. So we shot for 20 days um, in 2018 in the spring and then we're editing and then we realized we needed some more driving shots because none of our actors, we had to drive the van in the movie. So then we went back to Albuquerque and had two days of pickup shoots. Um, and yeah, Michael was with us every step of the way. Yeah. Happy to be here. Where are you both from and how did you get into film? Wow, taking it way back. I am from France, I grew up in Paris but my parents are Americans. So I grew up speaking French at school and English at home. And uh, always thought I wanted to be, or first thought I wanted to be a photographer and then thought I wanted to be a cinematographer. Um, and wound up in New York for school and then was PAing on shoots and kind of, you know, just, learning as I went and I worked for a production designer and I worked for a director and then decided to go to film school actually and uh, found the most affordable film school I could find which is in the Czech Republic. Went to Prague Film School for a year and met Kaylin Yatsko uh, and we were the only two women in the cinematography track at the school and so we were sort of like we're either going to hate each other or we're going to love each other and then we wound up shooting everybody's shorts together and then by the end of the year, I had this like epiphany of being like, actually, I think I'm a director. And Kaylin was like, yeah, you're definitely a director. Like I'm a DP. Um, but it, and it worked out because then that way we could keep working together. And she's shot everything I've ever directed since. And that was eight years ago. And so we made two features together. We have a production company together called Bicephaly Pictures, um, where we make commercials. So that's sort of our bread and butter mm -hmm. uh, and we do a lot of branded content um, which is how we first got connected to Michael because then when we were so we made our first feature which was an Icelandic movie and that came out in 2013 and then when I was writing short history it took five years between when I was writing to when it actually was out in the world but as we were in development and we were raising money and casting. Um, we did a series, hope I'm remembering this story right. I'm pretty sure this is how this happened. Um, but we were doing a series of videos with Michael Phelps around water conservation for Colgate. And then one of the, it was a doc series in one of the episodes um, we shot on Navajo Nation and met a bunch of great local crew um, and for who wound up being our camera department. And then I think some somebody who was on that shoot connected us, right? And then we stayed in touch for like two years and you were like, when are you shooting this thing? And I was like, the second we get any money to actually make it. Um, yeah. And then finally shot it. <laughs> awesome. Michael, what about you? Who are you and how did you get started in film? Where are you from? This will take like 10 seconds. Um, I'm from Las Lunas, which is like 20 minutes south of Albuquerque. So it's local all the way. Um, I got into film just by ants, luck. I don't know what to call it, but I ended up moving back home after being away for about 10 years. And it was to a point where I was like, what the heck am I going to do for a job? You know, like, and film. It happened to be a thing here that I had no idea about and just kind of um, started PAing um, and just kept going ever since. And now I'm in the assistant director role and got into the director's guild and I don't know, just kind of going with the flow, really. So, yeah. I love 
helping, I guess, other like female, fem uh, female filmmakers, uh, you know, do their dream and help them. I want to help them succeed, and I'll do anything I can to, you know, get them to get their stuff on stream. So. That's incredible. When I was looking at your resume, I was like, how did she get into film, and how did this, how did this evolve, and what what was your path? Because when you and I worked together, I was like. This chick's awesome. Like you're so mellow and so cool, and uh, yeah, it it was that was a crazy shoot. But you were so grounded and just so on top of everything, and I really enjoyed working with you. But you have to be. I mean, there has to be that one person that holds that balance. I don't know if it's like Libra in me or whatever, but I don't do well with the yelling. I can't handle people that yell at other people. So I'm just kind of the everyone's a human, so you know treat each other as such. I didn't know you were a Libra. I love Libras. <laughs> what you, Ani, what's your sign? I am full-blown Capricorn. Just a little sea goat. <laughs> my, I wrote my first feature last year, and the producers that we uh, optioned our script to are both Capricorns. They're both these amazing Capricorn women who just get it done. They're amazing. So I love Capricorns. But how long have you been working in film? Um, I would say I've been working in film in various capacities, uh, since, well, been working in the film industry since 2009. Um, but I would say I've been directing for eight years. And that's um, largely because I have my own production company. <laughs> I would not be able to do it otherwise. That's amazing though. So with Bicephaly Pictures, I was looking, I looked at your website and I looked at all the different projects that you've done. By the way, Role Reversal, that whole series. <laughs> oh, good. So <laughs> Thank you. That was a fun one. That was how, such a long time ago. What was that for? Was it through? It was for a glamour magazine. So we used to do a lot of sort of video content web series for different Condé Nast titles and for Teen Vogue and for Allure and for Glamour. And a lot of them were around yeah, women centered stories. And, uh, and so that was, that was a fun gig for a while. God, I can only imagine. And also, as, as an actress, as a woman, we don't always get the most interesting roles. And you don't get the most interesting roles until you're really established in your career. So to play something with sophistication or complexity is not always, you know, an option. So I would just imagine being able to see these incredible actresses just sink their teeth into something really fun and to watch them do their craft Oh, it was so good. It was so good. It was, it was great. I wish we had done more of those. Those were a lot of fun. Well, I hope with the success of this film that you have an opportunity to do more of that because we need more of that series. It was amazing. So that was so cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Michael, tell us uh, how long have you been working in film and how did you get into film? You kind of got into that earlier, but do it again. Uh, only going, I'm a baby, um, going on four years. Uh, so when I moved back to Albuquerque in 2016, I probably uh, got right into it maybe a couple months right after I moved back. Um, started PAing and some background work, which kind of led then to me doing some stunt work. And then I realized that I just didn't want to be dragged behind horses and thrown through walls anymore. So I uh, started watching crew members and was taking notice of every department because I had no idea what you know film production was like. I had no idea. I didn't go to film school or anything like that. So um, I kept. I just watched everybody like a hawk when I was on set. So hair and makeup, props department. And then what really caught my eye was the assistant directors that were the ones essentially running everything. I mean, they're like the, you know, 
Oz behind, you know, behind the camera. They're just controlling everything. And so that I'm a control freak, I just like that they had, you know, just, um, I don't know, a purpose, I guess. And, and they make or break the show, like, to be clear. <laughs> Exactly, and I've, I've definitely learned from some of the best and even some of the worst ADs on how to not be, you know, and I think I've learned more from the really bad assistant directors, and I think that's definitely helped me for sure succeed, so. But yeah, I just got in through, you know, got to working, but just by chance, really. I mean, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I was on the law school route, and this is completely different than that. I mean, I'm actually happy doing what I'm doing, so. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that about you. Yeah, surprisingly. Yeah, there's no way I could be a lawyer. <laughs> well, I think it takes that same kind of analytical mind. There's so many moving pieces, and also there's the empathy part of it. You're working with people, first and foremost. So it makes sense to me that, I mean, it's a totally different route, but there's a lot of similarities a lot of parallels i would think but i'm so happy to have you in the film industry because we need you and a lot of the law classes i took actually helped prepare me for you know contracts and all of the law lingo that kind of goes with the job as well so that's definitely helped prepare me for that so i mean it was a, a complete lost cause i would get questions from a lot of actors you know like what does this mean now what does this mean and i'm like to go through it all over again and I'm like pay attention to this clause you know like you're bringing your own clothes pay attention to this like the producers I know hated it but I mean I just want to make sure that everyone knows what they're getting into and signing you know? mm -hmm. well we appreciate you for that because I think I don't I'm not trying to talk trash here but I feel like actors are such big babies sometimes and they don't know how to read the fine print on their own so having someone there to help explain things to them is always appreciated <laughs> see you laughing <laughs> like <laughs> um yeah um, let me see let me go back to my list of questions okay the question is what production were you on in new mexico so short history the long a little movie yeah. called short history and uh yeah we started shooting wow my memory uh in 2018 in the spring and uh i ended up being there for two and a half months so we had basically a month to prepare a month of shooting and then two weeks of wrapping out mm -hmm. um but everybody was local outside of you know like a handful of folks um and we all were staying together, which was great. And then our our main six actors would all fly in, but the whole crew was local. All you know, all of our other actors were local, so it really um, was great to be able to like parachute down, but then just be like, "All right, we're here." Um, and, and be a part of this film community that's so strong and um, works a ton. It was tough to get such a great caliber crew because there were a bunch of productions going on at the same time and it was sort of right when the tax credit was really exploding. Mm -hmm. So I remember that being tricky, especially as a non-union job. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know it was a non-union film. Yeah, we were a low budget. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yes. I didn't know that. Um, I spoke with Lisa, and she was at her film office at the time. Oh, mm -hmm. what's going on? Yeah, you had, um, your yeah, Ani had high quality people, and we did act like we were high budget because, of, you know, everyone was professional, and really, at the end of the day, would get the job done, you know, so. Yeah, I had just assumed that it was Union. Well, because Michael, you were on it, and I, I don't know, I just thought that it was. It was such a fantastic film. It is such a fantastic film, but I didn't know it was non-Union. Um, I'm ousting myself. <laughs> it's a terrible. Well, and it, it, we'll take it. We're, we no, I wish we could have been Union. I'm not Union. Um, I wish I were. But uh, yeah, no, unions are the only thing keeping 
keeping people, you know, working decent hours and, and making sure that, I mean, it's, it can really go. Yeah, it can, yeah. A little, yeah. Yeah, Michael can speak to this. Non-union is the Wild West. Um, and, and so even, you know, for us as a non-union show, it was really important that, you know, we made our days and made sure that people, you know, felt comfortable and felt taken care of and were, you know, well fed and well rested and all of those things that don't necessarily, um, always happen, unfortunately. Um, even though we didn't have the the kind of financial means to be a union show, we wanted to mm -hmm. be as union as possible on all other counts. And there was a great um, part of the New Mexico tax incentive that's really great, um, subsidizes people's so if you put crew members as department heads for the first time and bump them up, their um, rate essentially is covered by the incentive. And so it's a really great way for people to get, um, you know, so like, for example, like our production designer, who's, you know, has years and years and years of experience, had only ever art directed. This was his first credit as a production designer. And so getting that bump was, really great um, for him and you know I was more than happy to you know take a chance on you know the, the reality is that like if you've worked in these departments for years you're absolutely capable of running a department you just need to be given the chance um, and so that is a component of the New Mexico tax credit that's unique to New Mexico and is really wonderful and I hope stays um, and so, so we had such a committed crew also because we had people who were department heads who were taking it really seriously because it was their first time having the credit and, and really kind of owning it and, and yeah, feeling really proud of, of their work and kind of having that ownership. And so I think that's also what made it really special. Yeah. yeah. And even Michael, like to be totally fair, like I, I mean, PA in name, but certainly more than a PA throughout the entire shoot and was just like fully like top of the AD team. What was that? Yeah, I got lucky. We, we had a really good team and um, like I said, I was, uh, you know, Ani were pen pals for, yeah, a couple of years and I had no Which was so funny because we never even met in person <laughs> Because uh, the vice shoot that we had done was like a three-day thing. Yeah. And then we were kind of traveling all around. But the the persistence, mm -hmm. the tenacity, yeah. what it takes. Yeah, I don't know, really. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so, I mean, you took a chance on me and got me an interview with the AD. And, I mean, the rest is history. But, um, yeah, so. And that was too... Two and a half, no, two years ago, right? A little over two years ago? And yeah, you just shot up ever since. I mean, you've been, and you've been working in LA and working in New Mexico and you pretty yeah. much haven't taken a break up until the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah, it's weird. I don't know what to do with myself. You're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So. Yeah, the film industry is going to look very different when we're on the other side of all of this. Yeah. If, if we ever do get on the other side of all of this. Well, we're jumping around because I was going to ask you about that too. What was it like to, did you have other plans for the distribution of the film or when it came out? Like, how did COVID change the Oh, did we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, in a parallel universe where our government didn't fail us and contained this uh, virus, we would have been in theaters, and instead we were in drive-ins, which was, you know, the only only show in town. So, you know, number three movie at the box office in America. Thank you, drive-ins. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, and then we, and originally we were going to have sort of a clean theatrical window, be in theaters for a month and then release online. But, um, once 
the pandemic hit and they shuttered theaters, we pushed it back as far as we could. And so then we were just going to have sort of a four day exclusive theatrical window mm -hmm. thinking at the, this was back in March thinking, you know, Oh, possibly some theaters might have reopened in some States. And then it got to the point where we were just like, even if theaters, and then, I mean, not for New Mexico and New York, but certain states, theaters had reopened. And then the question was, you know, do you, do you feel comfortable? Or for, basically for me, ethically, I was like, I don't feel comfortable going back to movie theater. So I don't want my movie in theaters to sort of like entice people, lure them out to a place that is not safe just because, you know, governors want to make money and feel comfortable sacrificing human lives. And so that became the sort of dilemma where it was like, you know, yeah, like it's every filmmaker's dream to have their movie play on a big screen, um, but uh, it's not safe. And it sort of felt like if I don't feel safe personally going to movie theater, why would I ever encourage anybody else to go and do it? Um, so drive-ins were, the safest move. And so we've screened there and then we had a digital worldwide release, which was great um, through this new platform called Gather. And so we were able to have sort of like a cast Q and A afterwards, which was live, which never could have happened, you know, in the before. Um, Cause you know, we have cast in, LA and in South Dakota and in Maine and I'm in New York and so we got to all uh have a, you know sort of a, a Q and a debrief which was nice and then and it, and it was uh international so we had like f people watching from 42 countries um so that sort of was one of the like silver linings of yeah just this whole new world of you know movies are gonna look completely different um on the other side of all of this from like from making them to distributing them to watching them and I think it's a lot of it is super overdue um like clearly you know people have been watching comfortably from home like it's it's been a trend um that obviously is like exploded but then also I think a lot of places and a lot of exhibitors and a lot of movie theaters like haven't wanted to update their model for a, a lot of different reasons but now are kind of forced to actually reckon with this um so yeah who knows I mean it, it's the first time that you know my uh, our producer Krishore was like I've never had one of my movies play at drive-ins and you know she's been producing for 10 years but it also feels like, well, it's the only game in town and this might be how we watch movies now. Um, so I don't know, we'll see. That's, that's wild. I can only imagine to have this incredible film and to have a plan and then to have everything just, nope, we're doing something different. I mean, I think we can all relate to that, all of our careers. I think, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, everyone's definitely been in that boat. And we're doing, we're actually doing a virtual screening on uh, the 14th, next Tuesday, with the Santa Fe um, Cinematheque. And then Maggie Sip and I are doing a Q&A afterwards, and that's going to be a virtual screening. So we'll see how that goes. That'll be our first theatrical screening. Where did you, where did you film in New Mexico? We were based in and around Albuquerque. And then the ending we shot, um, uh, you know, that was like at White Sands, like a, you know, four and a half hour drive. Mm -hmm. um, we shot a little in Los Lunas. Michael, where else do we shoot? <laughs> Um, we did the Sandia Crest. Yes. Los Lunas, and then of course Bobby Foster. Yep. Um, uh, yep. 
Bobby Foster was a key location. Everything um, was driving and everything was done, you know, um, car rigs and all that. So Bobby Foster was definitely probably the safest for us to do all that stuff for sure. But we had, we, I used to remember these numbers. We had like 70 ish locations. Um, on our 20 day shoot. So we were kind of constantly in motion um, as a road trip movie. But we had a couple places that we kind of anchored ourselves, mm -hmm. like the garage, like um, Maggie Siff's character, um, that house, which was our, our second AD's girlfriend's house. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, I mean, we were really on the move a lot. Mm -hmm. I guess one of my favorites, too, is where were we on? We're on tribal land. Where was it? In Jemez or? Yeah, Jemez. Yeah, and we, I mean, I remember they had to come and unlock the gates, and you can tell those gates haven't been opened in years. Right. It's beautiful. So that's what, I mean, that's what I love about this job. I mean, you can see different places of, you know, where, other people can't see, you know, so we get to go to all these really cool locations. That was probably one of my favorites because it was just so beautiful out there, minus the snakes, but. <laughs> minus the snakes, yeah. First time shooting with a snake wrangler. Yeah. yeah. There was a snake wrangler? No, yeah, we had a snake wrangler. Um, we had called him out that day because we had seen, um, there was a rattlesnake by one of our talents trailers. Yeah. And so we're like, okay, you know, like call the wrangler, they got in, I mean, within the hour. And so he was busy all day. He was probably with us for a while, at least a couple of days. Yeah, and he kept finding them like, you know. He ended up with so many snakes. And this guy, I don't remember his name, but he just looked like he just came out of the Wild Wild West. I mean huge white mustache the cowboy hat the chaps everything i mean he was new mexico true <laughs> you should interview him that's actually it was just that's me. who you should be talking to who is this guy this, this is amazing yeah only in new mexico well i guess there's rattlesnakes in california too but you know you're not going to get the guy with the mustache and the chaps that sounds yeah. that sounds <laughs> Holy crap, snake wranglers. And was that your job, Michael, of like wrangling the snake wrangler? The wrangler? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't pay me enough for that. So <laughs> I'm like, we're shooting here, we're shooting here, and he would go and clear the area that, you know, on a camera that, you know, actors would be walking down. He would make sure every, every nook and cranny was safe and whatnot. So we just had to tell him pretty much where to go. And he, cleared the way and I just remember he had something like over 40 snakes I think by the end of the day that he had to then go release back into the wild. Oh. Yeah no snakes were harmed. No snakes were on harmed. On our movie. Yeah. Let it be known. That's awesome. I love that. I love that this film really seems like it had a tight-knit group. It was really like a, a labor of love and a family in a way. It sounds like you had a really amazing dynamic on set yeah we really we lucked out I think it was it was I mean it was hard getting good crew because you guys are so I mean there's so many productions shooting there um and so I remember that being complicated but on the flip side what was great is that people who wound up you know coming on board really really wanted to be there like they certainly weren't there for the money. So it was sort of like, you know, people were there for, you know, for the story or for, you know, the title or for the opportunity. And so it's like, you, there was a sense of, you know, people were, were really kind of committed to it beyond it just being like, you know, like just another job, um, you know, to pay the bills, which, you know, is, a tricky thing to balance because I mean yeah like I don't I don't live off of 
my features like commercials is is how I make a living and so it is a complicated thing to and that I also think I don't know, again in in light of the pandemic where we're not shooting anything I think it's just becoming like incredibly clear like what is sort of like the amount that you the amount of work that you put into something is not accurately reflected by like the paycheck necessarily and on one hand that is sort of like like what what we're told like art is but it is an industry that makes so much money that um there's like a very big gap there mm -hmm. so yeah it's, and it's been really interesting having this time to 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 actually take a break and think about all of these things and kind of you know why why things are like the way they are um because i think even now as as shoots are starting to you know kind of begin again or or start to you know people are starting to think about when potentially shoots could be made safe again it's like yeah, like you know 14 16 18 hour days aren't shouldn't be normal aren't normal and yet they are you know like these these things that are considered industry standards aren't actually helping anybody um and so yeah i think it is complicated when you're making something sort of having that responsibility too because 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 it is such a luxury to make movies in a lot of ways I think what was working before is definitely not going to be working after this. No way. I mean, working 12 to 18 hour days. You know, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And just the sort, you know, everything around the sort of like the hygiene and what's like, you know, sanitary and what's safe and, and, and how little we know about this virus. And I think there's, there's a lot of conversations happening, but I think, and and I think it, there will be a sort of a, a sense of like, you know, people who can afford to stay home, like in, in every industry and people who, you know, are going to need to take the job mm -hmm. because they need the money and, and where, you know, and, and people who, for who it won't be worth the risk. And so... Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that should have been questioned a long time ago that now like actually have to be reckoned with. Yeah. Um, but I can't wait for us to be back on set together soon. I know. I feel like this time, I mean, it was so lovely to see this film, especially during a time of COVID and I'm watching it and I'm going, wow, this is so, I mean, all of the characters are well developed. The story is the focus. It's it's so good, but it makes me think that like that is. I mean, I'm I'm hoping that because of COVID, we're gonna have a distillation of story. You know, a focus on on characters. Like we're downsizing, right? We're hopefully that the story will become king and will be quality, and there's less people on set. And I'm hoping there will be projects that are labors of love, you know, I, I guess I'm just hopeful and that's the ideal, right? But I don't know. Um, how do you see film, how do you both see film changing and do you think that is true? Do you think that smaller independent productions are more viable pictures post-COVID? Um, I would like to say that they would be, but just, I mean, I think independence and small budgets are going to be hurting. I mean, just from the AD perspective of keeping everyone safe. Mm -hmm. I mean, PPE is gonna cost, tests are gonna cost, um, medics, insurance if an employee gets sick. I mean, it's all these things that are gonna cost you know, independence, I mean, shiny penny that they can already barely afford, you know? So I think, I mean, there's that to consider, but I would like to actually see more things of substance be developed and not all these, you know, action movies that are, you know, the same old thing every time. 
you know? So I want to see more art. <laughs> Cliche as that sounds, but yeah. No, I'm in the same. Uh, yeah. I'm tired of every Marvel film being exactly the same. I feel like all of the plots are interchangeable for me. So I don't know. My hope is that we see more detailed stories, more interesting characters, smaller casts. Like, I don't know, just the performances of, of your cast. They were so good. It was just, anyway. Um, Thanks. What? Yeah. Yeah. We had, a, we had such great, I, I loved our our cast was awesome. Yeah, I mean, everyone just showed up in this way that was like, no ego, no, you know, everybody knew what they were getting themselves into. You know, no sort of like crazy demands or like, you know, like insecurities. Like, I think people just like dove right in and it was such a treat. It was, yeah. So you wrote the script. What was the inspiration for the story? What was that process like writing? So I started writing the story. So I just finished my first feature, uh, which is a movie called Days of Grey, that is an Icelandic movie um, that is totally different, like sci-fi, post-apocalyptic, like very different world. Sorry, um, sorry what was that? silent film is there yeah so there's no it takes place in a future where dialogue where language doesn't exist anymore so there's no dialogue in the movie um but it uh is so it's not but it's not quite silent because basically it's i started out um directing a lot of music videos and this uh icelandic band called hjaltalin who just released a new album yesterday and it's wonderful uh was looking for a music video and so we were talking I was talking with them and then this the sort of treatment that I was writing for a potential music video would just snowball into a much bigger project and then we sort of settled on the idea of it being like an album like music video and then at that point they were actually ready to record a new album. And so we wound up making the movie and then they scored it. And then that score ended up being their album, their next album. And then they would play the score live during the screenings at the festival. So we then sort of went on tour. It just was like, it was a great, it was not at all what I ever anticipated my first feature to be. Um, but so it just turned into this big project. Um, but then they, but then coming off of that, I was like, okay, I, whatever my next movie is going to be is definitely going to be more, you know, just like your straightforward, independent drama, like, you know, just, just something that, that was, that kind of fit more in that. I mean, like, yeah, it was just such an anomaly of like, you know, movie music project live performance like it, and it was really hard to categorize for festival programmers um in the states i should say um so it mostly toured in europe and then so then i started writing short history i've always loved road trip movies um i've always loved road trips and then uh discovered this world of van dwelling and thought, oh, this would be a really interesting way to show someone who truly feels more comfortable on the road um, and, and why she would have, why she would choose this life um, because of how she was raised. And then around the same time, lost a close friend very suddenly and, and felt like I hadn't really seen on screen, like grief being depicted in a realistic way, in a way that I think a lot of movies like really try to kind of manage audiences' feelings. And so you kind of get the like, you know, coughing blood into the handkerchief. Like you get a lot of like, uh, you know, forewarning, but then in real life or sort of how I experienced it, it was like it truly comes out of left field and then you're sort of left to pick up the pieces and your whole world turns upside down and wanted to show that in a more 
you know, accurate way on screen. And so it was kind of like all of those different ideas combined of, you know, a, a, a road trip movie through the eyes of a young woman, you know, this, this world of van dwelling and like wrestling with grief that kind of all got, you know, put in the pot and stirred up and then, you know, we put it in the movie oven and now we have a short history cake yeah. to like fully take that metaphor to the, <laughs> all the way through. Um, so yeah, so those were kind of all the different threads. And then, and then the story kept evolving as I was writing because developing took so long because raising the financing took such a long time. And so originally we were gonna shoot in Louisiana and we scouted there. And then the tax credit just didn't, um, wasn't really existing anymore. And so then we were looking for where else we could shoot. And then as I had been writing the script, I took a, I ended up living out of a car for a couple weeks and, and writing and driving from Arkansas to California, but I drove through New Mexico. And so then when my producers were finding different states that had uh, like a tax credit that would work. I was like, oh my God, New Mexico would actually be perfect. Um, Cause I just loved driving through that state. And, and it actually had so many elements um, that made so much sense. Like having, you know, the, this character of blue who's indigenous and, you know, uh, Miguel R who's played by Danny Trejo, who, you know, was, Latino originally, and then is now more Hispanic, but it was sort of like all all these different elements made so much sense in New Mexico. And so then it all kind of came together and then, yeah, we were off to the races. But yeah, it was, it was, I, I ended up writing so many drafts just because we kept waiting and waiting and waiting for, you know, we'd get little chunks of you know, we'd get a grant here, we'd get, you know, an investor there, but it was a very long road. <laughs> I, that was one of my favorite aspects of the film. I thought that it was, I mean, what you were saying about grief, telling a, a grounded portrayal of what that's like to lose someone. I thought um, that was so poignant and so, so honest, because I, exactly what you were saying is you know, you get the blood and the handkerchief and there's a lead up to the loss and I just loved that the film I mean Sabrina Carpenter she's fantastic but just it, it's instantaneous and how what do you do when everything falls apart and you pick up the pieces I just it was so refreshing did you guys have any moments like crisis moments where you're like, oh shit, this isn't going to work out the way that we thought it did. Uh, every no, day. No, no. <laughs> not if I could help it. No. <laughs> um, crisis moments. Oh, there was a very, do you remember the day when we were shooting with Danny at the garage and that guy was just blasting music? Yeah, and Danny went to go pretty much do a PA lockdown on that guy. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, went across, yeah, four-way, uh, four-lane road, through traffic, and just to go tell these people to stop playing their music so loud and whatnot. So, of course, they're going to listen to Danny Trejo. <laughs> Who just shows up at their door. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. He just went over there and did they know who he was? I mean, how could you not know? No. Oh yeah, they fully, I mean, they like negotiated. They were like, great, so just sign like autograph something for us. So then our department had to print out like a headshot or something <laughs> for Danny to sign. And then yeah, sign now and we had to go give them to these people. <laughs> yeah, they, they knew what they were doing. But it was, I mean, yeah, he just fully handled it. Yeah. That's incredible. Trejo way to do it, too. <laughs> what? Sorry, what? No, it's such a Trejo way to do it. I mean, he just... Oh, yeah. He was just, just <laughs> running across a highway. <laughs> like, goodbye. 
<laughs> no, Danny. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, what was the casting process like? How did you attach your actors? What What did that look like? Casting was, yeah, just like a roller coaster um, situation. We had been doing offer letters, which was my first rodeo doing that. And it was basically, you know, sending in, you know, going through different agents um, for different actors for both the lead role of Nola, who's in every scene of the movie, and for Clint, who plays her father. And we, it was just like so many dead ends for so long. And then finally, it was just like, for, like these offers are not working because also by the time that they came on board it was like I it was just so out of my control and it's like you know you see their body of work but you can't you know you have no way of knowing how they're actually going to be um and so then we were just like okay we're scrapping this and I was basically just making list of just list after list of different actors who I thought could pull it off and just being like, this isn't going to be an audition. Like, I just want to get coffee with you. Um, you have to read the whole script, but this isn't like a casting process. This isn't like, you know, you're not putting yourself on tape. Like we're just getting coffee and talking about the story. Um, especially because there isn't a ton of dialogue in the movie. And so even, you know, having a we had a casting director at one point who was just auditioning people but even just watching you know video after video of, of people auditioning just wasn't really there's just you know they're getting a scene out of context with no sense of like what the whole movie is or the tone or the style and you're just sort of like it just sort of feels like a needle in a haystack situation for them and for me like it's like it's not they're not showing their best work i'm not seeing what they can actually do I think the whole casting process is just so deeply flawed in so many ways. Um, and there's, it's, and, and for having sort of filmed a lot of friends auditions, of, you know, and kind of reading with them, just being like, this is so silly. Like, you, and you never get any sort of feedback of like why you were chosen, why you weren't chosen. Um, so, this method was a lot more hands-on. So I ended up getting coffee with like 30 different young women and, and like total range of like, you know, people like Sabrina who had done TV, hadn't really done film, you know, people who had done tons of movies, people who hadn't done a single movie, but who, you know, were musicians or it was just like a very broad range. And then of the 30, um, then my top six, we did sort of like a callback, but that was like the first audition. And I, and, but it was, it was kind of more of a workshop because they picked two scenes or no, I picked two scenes that everybody had to do, but then they could each bring in any scene of the movie. Um, and then I also, and then I had two friends who were actors who came in. We basically just did a ton of like improv and just, just seeing how, how they were with different actors, how, you know, how they were with direction, how they were, um, you know, just kind of like putting their own spin on things. And Sabrina just nailed it. So she fully landed the part, but it was like, I mean, yeah, she like fought like hell for it. Um, and it's such a different role that, you know, than she's ever played. And so, you know, it was definitely like, I had to convince everybody on my side she had to convince everybody on her side um and but but for all of the sort of like time and effort and work that went into that like it you know it totally paid off because I think she, you know she really was the right person for it but I ne you know ne I never would have considered her and what and was continuously talked out of her kind of like every step of the way but um but now she's like getting 
like praised in every single review. So it's, it feels like a very sweet victory for both of us. Well, she's fantastic. That scene where she puts her dad's stuff in the donation collection bin thing. Oh my God. She's fantastic. She's so good. Um, I wasn't, yeah. oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, when she was doing that, because Sabrina and I talked all the time because I was, you know, the first team PA. And so like, we like, we got along and we talked pretty deep in, about our lives. And, um, and I had to get up. my dad died uh, six months probably before we started filming or so. And um, so we talked a little bit about that, you know, cause like the story, I just couldn't get away from scripts I had to do with a parent dying. And this was, I think the third movie that I did that had to deal with that. So I'm like, oh, here we go again. But um, I ended up telling Sabrina that and she was like, well, if you don't mind me asking, like, how did it make you feel? You know, like, and I was like, I was angry, you know, just mad and, you know, like, course and I would just start bawling and stuff and then um, I think she just you know like it was neat to like see her like want to like know you know mm -hmm. and, um, I remember watching some of the scenes on monitor while she was doing it and I just started just crying because I was like she nailed it you know and she just nailed the whole grief of it all and then seeing it in the theater I was like girl Sabrina she nailed it <laughs> But that was such a gift, or I mean, yeah, just talking about like everybody going sort of above and beyond the call of duty. It's like, you, you know, that was such a gift for her to be able to hear from you firsthand and like share that experience is, you know, she couldn't have gotten that from anyone else of, you know, like specifically, you know, being who you are and like that specific relationship is so important um and and yeah and, and it, I mean it, it really stayed with her yeah. it's great <laughs> how cathartic to be on a project like that I mean difficult as well but it just seems so synchronistic that everyone kind of ended up together for this story for everything that was happening um, I would like to know, how did you find, is it Jashan? How do you, is it? Oh, Jashan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so she was like literally the opposite of Sabrina in the casting process because basically I wrote the role with her in mind because I had seen her. Actually, no, that's not true. She, Blue was always in the script mm -hmm. um, and was always indigenous Mm -hmm. And she, but then I saw, uh, so um, my friend Chloe made a movie called Songs My Brothers Taught Me, which is the, the only other movie Jay Sean's ever been in. And she's, you know, 10 or 11 in that movie. Um, but she, she essentially is like, she is that entire movie. Um, and I remember walking out of the theater being like, yep, that's, that's our blue, like, look no further. Um, and so she, you know, was sort of cast, like, you know, she was the only, she was the real offer only. Um, and yeah, and she was, uh, in high school in South Dakota and, you know, flew in, like, literally like, went to her prom, got on a plane, showed up, uh, and then uh, shot, you know, for a week, and then just nailed it. She was great. What was your favorite part of making the movie? I loved, I mean, the, the last day of our shoot was pretty special in White Sands, and it was the same, it was Sabrina's 19th birthday, so there was, and it was the, it was the ending of the movie, it's the, you know, the last day of our shoot, um, you know, and we all kind of had to like caravan out and White Sands is such a bonkers place um, to be in. And, you know, we just shot at Magic Hour and it was basically like, you know, we had like a 20 minute window. <laughs> it was, it was very much like all hands on deck. All hands on deck, but it still felt 
kind of like just a little mini rap party at the same time because we had all the band dwellers there you know everyone got out all their gear and everyone was just like playing you know cornhole and kind of killing time until we had you know picture up so like everyone is just like kind of in their character i mean not really character just being themselves anyway and just you know having fun and stuff and then just shooting it at the same time when that sunset was just beautiful i mean <laughs> yeah that was definitely my favorite day Sometimes you're just like all these things and there was so much stress around like, you know, being allowed to shoot there and, you know, making sure everyone got there at the right time and, you know, like it was just like a very sort of like tense situation, but then like having everything just fall into place, yeah. um, the way that it did was just like, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it was a perfect ending for sure. <laughs> was that really emotional? To end on that note with the big sunset, it's the final scene. I mean, how did you feel? I mean, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of like, um, you know, you're just kind of like, I feel like it, or I mean, everybody kind of goes through it differently, but I feel like the, you're kind of just holding your breath the whole shoot, to be totally honest. Like, cause it's like, you know, something's gonna go wrong you just never know what it will be and it's never the thing that you're like anticipating will go wrong so you're just sort of just on pins and needles the whole way through and then you know on top of just sort of like since i was also like writing it you know while directing it we you know we'd be doing rewrites constantly you know based on like new actors coming in and out and then we had our editor on set who was cutting the movie as we shot and we were applying to this Sundance lab that we ended up getting. But then that, like we were sort of like doing this application while we were shooting. Cause we technically had to submit a director's cut which we didn't have cause we were like fully still shooting at that point. And so just everything about it was just very like a lot of moving plates and you kind of just keep thinking like, or you just know like someone's gonna drop the ball somewhere at some point. And that's just, you're like, you're just gonna have to roll with those punches. And so getting to White Sands was just like, okay, you can just breathe it out again. <laughs> Cause like at this point it's like, whatever's done is done. Um, and, and, we, and because we had been editing as we shot, we knew what we had. So there wasn't sort of any surprise of like, you know, and then the, the two pickup days that we had months later were just kind of added driving shots. But, you know, anything that we needed to reshoot, we could just grab it as we went. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, you're just kind of constantly like, you know, like in a state of disbelief. Like you're like, oh, this is, and also, ha you know, having been like picturing it in my head for four years, I was like, oh, this is what it looks like now? Because like, like as the director, everyone's always like, oh, this is exactly like, this is your vision. And it's like, no, like you're making it up in your head. Like you don't know what it's like, um, you know, and then in a lot of cases it was like, you know, this kind of like weird magic trick of, you know, writing a scene a certain way and then finding a location or finding actors that like perfectly fit the bill. And you're just like, oh, great, there it is but otherwise you are just like tweaking and adapting and so a lot of it is just like being on your feet and kind of staying flexible the whole time while also being like no 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 like this is the plan like we know exactly what is gonna happen and like this is all you know working out according to plan even though it's a plan that you're making up on the fly and so getting to white sands was just like the victory lap like we're like it's a movie now like they can never take it away from us <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. So that was a great feeling. Oh, I, I bet. So it was five years or four, five years? So, so it was four years of writing until we shot. And then it was sort of like five years total from like when I started writing to when it was like, you know, premiering. Yeah, that's incredible. And where in the process did you come on board, Michael? Where? Um, maybe a couple of weeks before day one, probably. 
officially, yeah. but we had been talking for a year before that. Yeah, I remember like, because um, I didn't know like who you were. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know you were the director or the writer, you know, and I show up to your guys' house. <laughs> And Artie, the first AD, he um, puts me out in the middle of the living room and is interviewing me like while everyone is doing their thing. And I remember you being there on your laptop, like, you know, we didn't talk or anything. I'm like, this is awkward, you know? <laughs> but yeah, like a couple of weeks before day one, and I was officially brought on. And yeah, probably one of the, the best experiences I've had filming, so yeah. <laughs> cool. um likewise no but i do think there was a lot of i mean you especially but you know within the crew just like people who really believed in this and really kind of fought hard even though there were like you know cushier better paid jobs out there or you know whatever and people who were like nope like i'm sticking with this one and i think that's kind of what ended up showing because I think it's sort of like even though like for myself and so Kaylin who's the cinematographer and who's also one of the producers it's like you know you kind of like you know you hope that you're you know finding the best people but the reality is you're kind of just like parachuting in with no context of anything and then it's like you know like we were out getting tacos one day in pre-production we were like oh these tacos are delicious and then we just first started talking to the guy um and then we were like oh do you want to do catering like could you cater our shoot like this food's so good like it's like you kind of just find people and and try to slot them in but you it's like you're taking everyone's kind of gambling on each other so it's like you, you are kind of like well hope you're not a total lunatic or you know like there is like a feeling of like you know, the, like the vetting process in film, for better or for worse, is very much like on a handshake. Like there's no sort of like, you know, like let me check your references and like do a deep background search. Um, and so it's a leap of faith that sometimes you're rewarded for, sometimes not. But um, I feel like we really, lucked out and had a yeah. really good gang. I think a lot of it too had to deal with, you know, the leadership. I mean, you, Kaylin, Bettina, mm -hmm. Ed, you know, I mean, I think once everyone got to know you guys and you guys treated everyone like humans, you know, you guys weren't those cocky directors and producers, you know, so I it's think- a low bar. <laughs> But no, I think once, you know, everyone got to know you and was like, okay, like, I will do anything for these people, you know? So I think everyone, you know, like pretty much established each other as like ride or dies at that point, you know? I mean, I think everyone on that crew, you know, definitely go to bat for one another. I mean, I've and worked it feels like a lot of people have kept working together since. Yeah, yeah I was about to say, I mean, I've worked with the grip in electric departments, I mean, multiple times, uh, Daniel and Megan a bunch of times, I mean, the sound, you know, um, uh, yeah. Daniel and Eduardo. Eddie, yeah, but um, so I worked with everyone so many times where it's like, they're my go-tos for any films that I do, you know, like, we need to crew up, and I'm like, I have a list. <laughs> yeah, and we've had, I mean, you know, I've, like, you know, I've since had friends who've been like, oh, you know, we're thinking about shooting in New Mexico. I'm like, take our crew list. Like, just take it and just one-stop shop it. Like, you don't need to vet. Like, all of these people are so yeah. rock solid. Yeah, I think that's how I got on with um, Natalie with Kaya. That oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, you're just, just take this list. Take this, yeah. And it's great because it is like, I mean, it does make such a difference. Um, you know, I mean, I was come like we were, all of us were coming in as like total outsiders and, and the same thing had happened 
in Iceland with our first feature where it was very much like you are like guests in this place that like isn't your home Mm -hmm. and and kind of being able to make it worth people's while like you know there's like I, I mean New Mexico and Iceland are wildly different places but they're they actually have a lot more in common than you would think and I think there is like this sort of like you know beautiful like mystical landscape quality that like tons of people want to shoot there and they and and I feel like film kind of latches on to certain location and is like this you know and then like the tax credits explode and what have you and it's like all of a sudden um you know these places that like kind of have to like build an industry overnight um and sometimes it goes away and sometimes it doesn't and you get like a real film hub and I it feels like again whatever pandemic aside it feels like that is what is happening with New Mexico in a lot of ways like people are really investing in you know infrastructure and studios and and so it's important to kind of keep these crew you know keep the good people working working because it's like it you know I think people want to feel like film is this sort of meritocracy and it is on some level and it really isn't in a lot of other ways so I think you know any any time that you can kind of you know keep keep the good eggs working it's like yeah like let me make your life easier take this crew list everyone has been like thoroughly vetted and like will like bleed for this project and it's like that's what every single producer wants to hear what was financing like like you didn't did you have financing okay yeah yeah. no 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 did did we have a lot of what resources to work with or what what was that so we ended up so the budget ended up being like just under a million and we started out I mean by you know once it was all said and done like Kishori our producer will teach uh film financing sometimes and she like always uses short history as like this textbook example because like every single possible kind of financing we ended up having like we had seven different um investors so we had private equity we had five different grants um that were great and were sort of both like you know sentence and tribeca and like institutional support but then we also had like this great camera package that was granted to us and our entire post was in kind through this great uh canadian company called eggplant um and we had the new mexico tax incentive um and so like all of these powers combined made the movie but it's it was like definitely um like every single possible type of like film financing under the sun and which is also why it took so long because it was so piecemeal um and a lot of it was because you know people like production companies and and financiers would read the script and be like you know i love i love the story you know i you know it sounds like such a great project but you know there would always be some reason why they couldn't do it and nobody wants to be um the first money in and bettina who was one of our producers um was actually the first one to be like we we had known each other from film school and she was very much like yeah like uh, you know all these people who say that you know they they like it but 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 like if i am the first one to sort of like put my money where my mouth is then they don't have an excuse anymore and so um she was really kind of the first spark that set the whole thing in motion and like guaranteed like it would still just be like a PDF on my computer if it wasn't for her. So, um, yeah, she, she made it all happen. Did you ever think that there, that it wasn't going to happen? Oh yeah. I mean, not really because I feel like we have like this like chronic, like finisher syndrome where it's like anything we start, we like, 
like whatever see it through like to the bitter end like for better or for worse um but there were a lot of moments where it was just like what like maybe it's time to write something else or like something different or like have something um and a lot of people like I did you know it got into a couple different screenwriting labs and a lot of, you know, like, like the film independent screenwriting lab was very much like, oh, like this is your sample. Like you're writing this as like a, a script that then you can show to people and it's sort of like your stepping stone to other things. And I was like, no, 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 like I'm writing this script because it's gonna be a movie. And I think there is something like really naive in, saying that because you know I mean and now even of like there was five of us in that program and it's like we did it in 2010 and short history is the only one that's like a movie from that so it's like it absolutely like they were right like those other scripts did end up being samples and people ended up making other things just not the scripts that they brought to the lab um but uh but yeah, I mean, I sort of thought even if it didn't happen, it would happen in some other way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then I think a lot of it too came like, you know, at, at a certain point it's like, you know, you've gotten these grants, you've gotten, the, you know, you have enough little pieces of the puzzle that it's like, it's not just you anymore. So it's like, you kind of need to see it through because you know, like, Michael's been emailing me for a year at this point, like, I can't let down Michael now, like, it just, like, you just, at a certain point, are just, like, you, you drag enough people behind you that, you know, you kind of need to see it through for yourself and for everybody else, because you, you know, you kind of, like, set it all in motion, um, so, yeah, for better or for worse. <laughs> so you can see the movie, uh, anywhere you watch movies it's available on digital it's available on demand uh and then you can check us out at on our website shorthistorylongroad.com on instagram at shorthistorylongroad on twitter at road film um we have dvds we have blu-rays we have hats we have shirts all the profits for our poster t-shirt go to uh, the movement for Black Lives Matter. And we've raised $3,000 so far, but we're on, I think we're on track to raise 5,000. So um, yeah, buy, buy those shirts. What else can I plug? Thank you for doing this. I appreciate you both so much. It's been, like I said, I haven't done any of these Zoom interviews. So this has been interesting. <laughs> Did oh, you? this was great. Any excuse to see Michael's face, I'm like on board. And yours. I mean, uh, we saw each other in New York, LA, and then back here a handful, like what, three or four times in New Mexico? Yeah. It doesn't matter where we are. I mean, if we're around each other, we're going to see each other. Exactly. I know. I'm like, oh, take me back to New Mexico. I want to go back. Yeah. The second summer hits in New York, I'm j you're like everyone is just like a pool of humidity. Yeah. Like, give me that dry, dry heat. Uh, yeah. what for. <laughs> True. Yeah. I just I love that we did this because I feel like these are so cool. I just want to like pop open a bottle of wine and hang out and talk about movies and and also talk about what's going on with the world and yeah it's just it's so cool a lot I know that <laughs> we would need more than a bottle of wine for that one I know I'm like that's that's like a whole other thing but yeah we're in it yep. we're in it thank you for taking the time to talk with me and um oh hell yeah I'm just like yeah, this has been great just, yeah, I'm like, I want to turn the this off and call you guys back and be like, uh, let's go open wine and talk. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, so nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Keep us posted once it's out and we'll, we'll put it out on our 
social channels too. I'll send it to you before we post it. So that way you can announce it and post it on your pages and all of that stuff. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks. It was yeah. great seeing you, Michael. Miss you. you. Let's talk soon. Well, okay. Okay. Take care guys. Bye. Bye.